This will be recorded and I will post this up uh, to uh, the Blackboard as a YouTube link uh, afterwards so you guys can, can review it if you have any questions about uh, the stuff. So again, this is uh, participatory, so you guys will uh, basically flash my question uh, and you guys will give your best answer as quick as you can. I gave you about 60 seconds per question, I tried to, uh, and then... Um, this is not. This is pretty indicative of the test. I think I was making these up yesterday, uh, kind of looking at the test and trying to make kind of similar questions. Um, I might have put like you know two right answers on a question or two here or there. So these, some of the none of these will be trick questions, but some of them may have multiple correct answers. Obviously, the test will only have one right answer, right? Okay, so let's get started. You guys excited? It's pretty fun. All right, 25 questions. I hope so. All right, so which of the following would be an example of a positive feedback loop? Oh, yeah, so you'll click uh, whatever you think the right answer is. A positive feedback loop. Hmm, what do we think? Clot formation in injured vessel, glucagon release during hypoglycemia, ADH, dehydration. The winners will get a prize, just FYI. Uh, a non substantive prize. <laughs> The correct answer was clot formation in an injured vessel. Okay, so remember, all right, let's go to the, 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 at least talking about it. So remember, clot formation was an example example of a positive feedback loop where you would have clotting factors that would feed back and continue activating further factors, right? Because you want to have that big clot form wherever the vascular injury was occurring and then have it stop eventually when you have other anticoagulants that come into play. That's a positive feedback loop. Why is PTH release in, uh, in response to hypocalcemia not a positive feedback loop? What happens when your calcium levels come up? Yeah, calcium levels come back and tells the parathyroid, hey, stop releasing PTH. I got enough calcium here. Shuts it down, right? Uh, how about release of antidiuretic hormone in response to dehydration? Same thing. Once I drop the osmolarity of the blood by intaking more water, that will lower the uh, the uh, you know lower the osmolarity and allow the ADH to stop secreting that. Okay. Uh, how about glucagon during in, uh, during hypoglycemia? Exactly. All right. So once the increase in, in blood sugar occurs, and it says, "Hey, we don't need more glucagon," it stops. Good. What are some other examples of positive feedback loops? Oxytocin during during labor, right? That was another good example. Um, like luteinizing hormone during um, uh, you're getting ready, uh, getting a follicle ready for ovulation, right? So all those would be good examples of that. Awesome. All right, moving on. We get to see in real time who who the strong ones are versus. No, I'm just kidding. No, it's fine. This is just a review. It's nothing bad. All right, so which of the following RNA molecules is used to transfer genetic information to the ribosomes? Coming in pretty quick here. You guys need to know this one. To click any random shape. <laughs> Okay, what is the correct answer? Messenger RNA. Perfect. Now, what does transfer RNA do? Shh. What does transfer RNA do? Yep, carries amino acids to the ribosome so that the messenger RNA can be translated uh, and you have an increasing protein chain. Um, well, the pre-RNA is going to be, uh, pre-messenger RNA is kind of like before it's been uh, fully been spliced and all that kind of stuff. You have the, like the micro-RNA that will come in and, and deal with some of that. So that one doesn't necessarily leave uh, necessarily, but it doesn't necessarily carry the, that's not really the RNA getting to the ribosomes which you need to, to make proteins, essentially. That's kind of what I was trying to get at there. Okay. Everyone make sense? 
I know it's kind of tricky because transfer RNA, you think I was transferring information from the nucleus to the, the ribosomes. Not necessary. I was transferring amino acids to the growing protein. Yes. All right. Moving on. Going up in an elevator will activate which organ? The utricle, the organ of corti, the saccule, or the semicircular canal? We'll see who watched the video. Or who watched the video and forgot. <laughs> So notice this just isn't, you know, which one can detect vertical uh, linear acceleration. It's something like you're in an elevator or you're in a car or you're falling off a cliff or you know, things like that. All right, the answer is the saccule. So remember, if you're looking at the vestibular apparatus, uh, looking at the saccule, that is the one that's going to be kind of or, uh, oriented uh, vertically, right? So that one, because you guys remember those um, those nice calcium carbonate crystals that kind of move in response to that linear acceleration. Which one does uh, horizontal acceleration? Utricle does that. How about the semicircular canals? What do they do? Like rotational movement, absolutely. And then the organ of corti? That's going to be for hearing, yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Moving on, Don Juan coming out in front. Great. Glycolysis takes place in which part of the cell? These are randomized, so it doesn't um, necessarily all the uh, sections are in order. You tell based on like the ambient talk, like which ones like people really know very well, or people are like, I don't know what, what do you think it is. <laughs> Someone's like, I got this, I'm clicked. The cytoplasm. It's a little tricky too, right? So, uh, which which steps are taking place within the mitochondria? The Krebs cycle. Oxidative phosphorylation, all right, those two steps are actually occurring within the mitochondria. The actual glycolysis where we're breaking glucose into carbonic acid is actually occurring within the cytoplasm, okay? Um, what happens in the Golgi apparatus? Yeah, you kind of get the new vesicles being formed as we're kind of like packing things up and getting them ready to transport to wherever they need to go, whether it be for exocytosis or whether it be to other parts of the cell. Uh, good, and yeah, so you guys know what the nucleus is, so we don't need to uh, del deliberate on that. All right, moving on. An asymmetrical cornea can lead to which condition? Stigmatism. So, what is hyperopia? Far sightedness. So, what can they see very well? Stuff far away. I can't see. So close. Okay. So, what's kind of the main defect there? Where's the the focal point of light? It's behind the retina, right? So, we need usually something to help to bring that light in a little bit further. So, what type of lens can we use? Concave. concave lens, right? Because that's going to help to bend that light even further. So it kind of helps the lens out by already starting to refract that light before it even hits the, the lens. So it's going to bring that focal point forward onto the, the fovea, okay? Uh, Emetropia is what? Normal vision, right? Myopia, nearsightedness, all right? So they can see things close up, not far away. What's their main problem? Yeah, usually the, the uh, eyeball is too long. And where's the focal point? <coughs> front of the retina, right? So now we need something to bend that light further so that way it doesn't get quite so uh, bent by the lens itself. So we use what kind of lens? Yeah, we use a convex lens. Uh, and so for astigmatism, what's kind of a problem? It's kind of wonky, kind of asymmetrical, right? So what kind of lens can we use for them? 
a cylindrical lens, right? So it's kind of one of those things where it's like trying to help to fix both defects of both kind of vertical and horizontal. I'm sorry, I meant to say concave lens. Yeah. So convex lens is going to be for the myopia. I'm sorry, it's going to be for the the hyperopia. Okay, so going through it again, just so again, because we're all humans, so we can get these stuff kind of goofed up, right? Um, so for myopia, they're going to be using a concave lens because they're going to be able to to bend that light even uh, or try to, to pull it back out, right? So that way they can bring the, the focal point uh, to the right spot. But the hyperopia, oh, you guys, we had to write the first time we said it. So hyperopia, right? So it's far sightedness. Right, so they can't see stuff close, close up. So I need something to bend that light. So they're going to be using a uh, convex lens. Yeah. Yes. For the myopia, they need a concave lens. Yeah. Okay. Apologies if I said that incorrectly. That is, that is correct. Um, there's a good slide on there where it kind of shows all four together. And you can see where, where that's going to be. Right, so you can see which one's which. Again, if I was an optometrist, I would be able to rattle that off. But I'm a pharmacist, so we don't do that as much. Yes. Basically, it's not really, you can kind of see it in that picture. Um, the, basically, it's not going to be the same kind of thickness all the way throughout. So part of it will be thicker than uh, the rest of it. And so it kind of helps to reflect light. So because, you know, with the stigmatism, you have multiple focal points that are being shown, shown onto the retina. So we're trying to bring those in. So part of it needs to kind of bring in further, sometimes less. So um, like I said, an optometrist will probably give you a better... Uh, wait, I didn't really see that terminology about it. Yeah, so thicker on the bottom versus thinner like on the top or something, right? So it depends on their defect. And so uh, it's one of those things where like for every uh, person with astigmatism, it might differ a little bit. So maybe it needs to be thicker on the top versus on the bottom. Just just depends on what their, their actual vision problem is. So it's one of those things where like, you know, when you go to the eye doctor and they're like, is it better or worse, better or worse? Like they basically have to get it focal in, in two different planes, essentially, right? Yeah, where the thickness is versus where it needs to be thinned at, yeah, right. Okay, moving on. Everyone cool with that so far? Fantastic. All right. Moving on. Uh, which of the following is a byproduct of oxidative phosphorylation? H2O2, H2O, CO2, O2. What do we think? And the answer is carbon dioxide. So, and water. There's two right answers. Ah, gotcha. No. Um. So again, there's only be one right answer on the on the test, but I wanted to at least illustrate that. Yes. So we have two byproducts that are the main thing there. Um. So what is uh where's O2 uh being utilized? Well, it needs to be utilized for that that process to occur, right? But the byproducts are water and carbon dioxide. Uh. What about H2O2? Where do we see that being used at? Yeah, they're destroying, like kind of breaking down things. So we see in those like peroxisomes, right? We talked about like in the liver. So that's where you're going to be seeing a much more H2O2 because that's a very reactive molecule. It can break open those, those hydroxyl radicals and can, uh, you know, denature protein, all kinds of things. So fantastic. <coughs> all right. Bitter taste is mediated through which type of receptor? Hydrogen ion, tyrosine kinase coupled receptors, G protein coupled receptors, sodium channels. What do we think? What do we call the process of taste? The station. Very fancy word. It's a good face where, yeah. Station. G protein coupled receptors. So, what is mediated through hydrogen ion receptors? Or hydrogen ion channels. Acidic. Yeah, acidic stuff. So it's going to be a kind of sour taste, right? Um, and then your uh, sodium channels are going to be better for salty taste, right? So think about like your Sour Patch kids. They're going to be affecting what first? 
No, Sour Patch Kids. What do they, they hit first? Sour. Yeah, they're gonna be hitting. They're gonna be hitting the the acidic, uh, the the sour part first, uh, and then they'll be hitting the uh, so G proteins. Uh, um, I'm sorry, the hydrogen ions first, and then when they get sweet, then sweet's gonna be mediated through what as well. G protein, right? So sour through the hydrogen ions, salty through the sodium ions, and then uh, the other two are gonna be through the G proteins. The downstream processes are a little different, whether it's uh, initiating you know calcium or whatnot, uh, but those are the main uh, mediators there. <laughs> That's going to be for uh, like sour taste. Yep. Okay. So moving on. So overactive parafollicular cells in the thyroid gland could lead to increased levels of. Uh oh, let me speak. Oh, we think. <laughs> Calcitonin. So where does where does PTH come from? From the parathyroid, that makes sense. Uh, iodine is not really a product that gets secreted from uh, the thyroid gland, uh, but calcitonin comes from the parafollicular cells, right? That's where it's coming from. So calcitonin, what does the calcitonin do? Should lower calcium, right? So it's on the flip side of PTH, right? So your parathyroids are going to lose PTH in response to hypocalcemia. Calcitonin is going to be seen when you have hypercalcemia to try to, you know, de uh, decrease osteoclast activity, decrease uh, the amount of calcium absorbed from the GI tract, help kick more out in the kidneys, right? Okay. Moving on. Shope is now number one. Okay. Uh, superior rectus muscles controlled by cranial nerve. This is also known as the trochlear uh, nerve. Mm -hmm. What is the correct answer? And the answer is, I'm sorry, not the superior right? That, this is not the stroke learner. I was thinking the um, the superior oblique. I'm sorry. Um, so I misspoke on that one. But anyway, the answer is correct here, right? So the superior rectus, what does that do for our eyeball? Should move it up, right? Up and a little bit uh, kind of laterally. Uh, what does cranial nerve number one do? Smell. Cranial nerve number two. Sight. How about number four? <laughs> Sorry, that's a superior oblique. Uh, that's a trochlear nerve, actually. So I apologize if I, if I led anyone astray on that one. But yeah, three is going to be responsible for moving which ones? Not all the rest. Yeah, except for the latter, uh, lateral muscle there. So lateral is going to be through which nerve? Six. Six, yeah. So the, the medial, the superior rectus, the uh, inferior rectus, and also the inferior oblique is all going to be through uh, cranial nerve number three, right? Make sure to keep those straight. Um, what else was I going to say? You guys remember that Simpsons episode where uh, Bart had to figure out which um, door to go through based on Roman numerals? Is that Rocky 2 plus Rocky 3 equals Rocky 5? <laughs> never, never get him. So. Maybe too old for you guys. All right. Uh, rapid rise in membrane voltage during an action potential occurs due to. Well, actually, should have pretty good. So it would be this portion of the action potential. What do we think? Mm -hmm. 
Do you guys want to hear a joke about uh, sodium? Yeah. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> yep, sodium is the correct answer. So remember, um, when you had that rapid depolarization occur, usually if it's either, uh, you know, it's a due to an actual potential actually hitting the cell or like when we look in the cardiac uh, cycle, um, you'll see a certain pacemaker cells. But basically, um, sodium influx is going to be a big thing that causes that, that rapid increase in, in membrane voltage. Um, what does potassium efflux do? Helps to it helps to reset the thing by bringing it back down and make it more electronegative, right? Because potassium levels on the inside of the cell are much higher than on the outside. So when those channels open up, it helps to reset the cell by uh, hyperpolarizing it, okay? Um, how about calcium influx? That's actually going to be really important for um, especially cardiac cells because that will help to lead to a kind of a plateau effect, which we'll see. So that can help to um, keep uh, electronegativity, uh, keep the voltage high for a long period of time. But also calcium influx is really important for um, activating like, you know, uh, muscle contraction and different things like that. Uh, but not causing, calcium does not actually cause that rapid uh, rise there. And what will chloride efflux do? That doesn't really happen. That would... It would also cause um, the, the voltage to go up because, you know, if you are getting rid of negatives within the cell, but it doesn't really happen because um, we see that uh, chloride is usually in a higher concentration than the outside of the cell, right? Because uh, usually the proteins and things like that are usually going to be the main number uh, source of like anions on the uh, intracellular side. So sodium influx would be the big thing causing uh, that uh, depolarization. <clears throat> They can flow independently of one another because once, because again, what type of bond is that? It's an ionic bond. So they, uh, once the sodium donates an electron over to chloride, you have chloride, you know, the negative uh, form of it, and you have sodium in the, in the positive state. Um, they can dissociate from one another, right? So sodium can go independently of chloride at that point. Some of it may be associated together, but it can go independently. Not necessarily. Um, chloride, usually chloride influx is really important for um, actually hyperpolarizing cells. So for instance, if you're having a seizure and you're having too much, uh, too many action potentials firing in the brain kind of in an unorganized fashion, we can give you drugs that actually will open up chloride channels like chloride to influx and actually hyperpolarize the cell and make it harder for those to have an action potential. So yeah, they can certainly be independent of one another. See another question? Yes? Well, if I, if I had efflux of chloride out of the cell, that would actually cause it to be more more positive, right? Yeah. Because, again, you have less negatives on the inside, so you become more positive on the inside. Okay. Continuing on. Seeing some changes. Yeah, all right. Uh, do I need to investigate anyone for ties of collusion like that? Just, just check. Get Comey on it. All right. Uh, removal of the adrenal glands would cause which of the following? High cortisol levels, high ACTH levels, low somatostatin levels, or low CRH levels. See some confidence there. <laughs> so think about your negative feedback loops and think about your the thalamus and the hypothalamus and the uh, pituitary gland. High ACTH levels. All right, it's a little bit of a spread there. So why would high cortisol levels not be correct? I need adrenal glands to have cortisol levels, right? So unless I was given it exogenously, the levels should be uh, non-existent, okay? Uh, how about low CRH levels? Why is that not the case? Yeah, so the hypothalamus is, doesn't sense any cortisol around, so that negative feedback loop would never be activated. So you'd actually have high CRH levels, okay? Um, low somatostatin levels is not really germane to this discussion because uh, what does somatostatin normally do? Growth hormone inhibiting hormone. Yeah, so that really wouldn't have any factors here with the adrenal glands. But high ACTH levels, which gets released from? Anterior, anterior pituitary, right? So the hypothalamus is what's releasing CRH. 
corticotropin releasing hormone onto the anterior pituitary, and that's producing ACTH. Okay, and so we were mentioned, and actually we were talking about doing this. Uh, I was working uh, at Nemours over the weekend. I was actually staffing Saturday and Sunday, and we were actually talking about. Uh, we had a patient who had actually really, really profound endocrine uh, dysfunction, and one of the things they were talking about doing was actually doing some ACTH uh, testing, where basically what they can do is uh, they detect to see how well the adrenal glands can respond to ACTH. You're trying to figure out what the problem is this patient. So if you um, give them a dose of ACTH, and all of a sudden their cortisol levels jump up, then you know that the problem is they don't have enough, uh, you know, hormone coming out of the anterior pituitary, right? If I give them a bunch of ACTH and their cortisol levels stay low, I know the problem is with the adrenal gland. Okay, so there's actually ways you can actually use these different substances to determine what kind of actual organ dysfunction they have going on. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, moving on. So pretty close, pretty close. All right, what is the end product of meiosis one? Two haploid cells, four diploid cells, two diploid cells, or four haploid cells? <laughs> ah, got to read the questions. Number one rule of test taking, probably read the questions. Can you change your answer? I don't know. <laughs> two diploid cells right so basically meiosis one is just kind of mitosis but what's the main difference the crossing over that occurs right and where's where's crossover happen Prophase one, right? So prophase one, so we have crossing over the different chromosomes, so you get some some genetic variation there. Uh, and then at the end of meiosis one, you have two diploid cells, but they've changed some genetic material. At the end of meiosis two, you have or haploid cells. Okay. Again, if this was just mitosis, what would be the correct answer? Mitosis would be. Two diploid cells, right? The only time you're making haploid cells, because again, haploid just means. Yeah, shh. It's competition is strong, right? No. Um, yeah, so basically, when you have um, the, the haploid cells, only have how many copies of the, the chromosomes? Just one, right? So the diploid cells are going to have both, both copies of that. So in the end of mitosis, you end up having two diploid cells. Meiosis one, the only difference here is you're going to have uh, that crossing over, so there's some, some variation. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so at the end of meiosis one, you have two cells, and both of them have both copies of the, their chromosomes, right? Because that's why you have two, two diploid cells. And when you undergo meiosis two is when you have that further uh, breakdown of that. They, they split up again, right? Because you're not generating any new, any new, pro, uh, any new DNA at that point. Um, they split up. Now you have four haploid cells. And those can go into either be an ova or it can be a sperm. So, of the, when you get into meiosis two, mm -hmm. I thought it was just splitting the central nucleus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, you undergo the whole process again, right? So it, with meiosis one, you've already had, you go through prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. Uh, for meiosis one, and then you do undergo the same process for uh, meiosis two. It's just the fact you haven't had a doubling of the, the uh, DNA at that point. So if you go back and look at the pictures, um, you'll see. Yeah, if you have any questions, over, like I said, um, I will take questions up until uh, you know the night before the test, uh, whenever I go to bed. So um, could be midnight, could be a little bit earlier than that, uh, probably a little bit earlier than that. But uh, I'll try to entertain questions as long as I can. Okay, continuing on. So which of the following solutions would cause cells to swell and potentially lice, which is not so swell?
All right, so we have two correct answers here. Okay, so again, what are we testing here? Tonicity of the fluids, right? So again, which one of these uh, fluids would end up being isotonic to the cells? Lactated ringers, right? Because that's a solution we have that is meant to be, uh, try to uh, closely approximate what the plasma is, is, is in regards to different electrolytes. Um, what other answer would be isotonic? 0.9% sodium chloride, right? So 0.9% is normal saline. Okay, so that would be isotonic to the, the cells as well. Um, what would happen if I gave 3% saline? Hypertonic, you see a crenation because it would draw water out of the cells, right? So it would crenate the cells. Now, on the other hand, we have iso, uh, hypotonic fluids like uh, quarter normal saline. So, right, so uh, half normal saline would be 0.45%, quarter normal would be 0.22%. Um, that would cause some swelling of the, of the cells, right, because it's hypotonic, water would flow into the cells. Probably wouldn't see any of that lysing actually occur, uh, but you certainly could see it with water, right? So, this would be much more likely to cause that lysing to occur, but both could cause cells to, to swell to some volume. Mm -hmm. Right, just like we like to give it for cerebral edema, we have too much uh, fluid in the uh, in the blood brain or across the blood brain barrier. We can give hypertonic saline to put, draw water out of there and relieve that pressure. Yeah. All right, <coughs> starting to pull apart. Yes, yes, ma'am. The water, right? Because that has no as a very hypotonic, right? Because it's what, what would be the osmolarity of water? Zero, right? Um, at least with quarter normal saline, you have some solute in there. Um, and so typically, like, we'll give patients, occasionally we'll give patients quarter normal saline, but it's usually like if they're um, hypernatremic, so they have too much sodium in the, in the bloodstream, we can give them that to actually try to dilute it out to some degree. Yeah, but water has no solutes in it. It would be, uh, have an osmolarity of zero, cause all those cells to, to definitely try to swell up. All right. All right, during heavy menses, which hormone would be stimulated to replace raw, lost red blood cells? That was pretty, pretty much a gimme. All right, so erythropoietin would be stimulated. Where does erythropoietin get stimulated from? Yeah, the kidneys. So you got to have kidneys in order to generate erythropoietin. Um, oxytocin would not be the case. Um, where does oxytocin get released from? Posterior pituitary, right? Uh, aldosterone, where does that come from? The adrenal glands, right? Those are coming, that's our mineralocorticoids. That's coming from the adrenal glands. Um, and then cortisol. Yeah, it'll be getting, coming from the, uh, the adrenal glands as well. Erythropoietin would be the correct thing, though, to stimulate red blood cell production. Yeah. All right. Blank affects the blank muscle to cause mydriasis. Could be acetylcholine, norepinephrine, and does it affect the circular or the radial muscles to cause mydriasis? Would you say these types of questions are indicative of the exam? Um, the concepts, yes. Yeah. So like, I wouldn't have blanks. Uh, I, don't, I don't think I have any blanks on the test. Um, but yeah, certainly knowing how these different neurotransmitters can affect uh, the muscles and how that will affect my, uh, meiosis and mydriasis, that would be good to know. All right, it's a good even spread there. So acetylcholine is going to do what? That's coming from the parasympathetic or the sympathetic nervous system? Parasympathetic, good. And so that's going to cause what to the pupils? Cause them to contract, to cause meiosis, right? Not mitosis, but meiosis, right? So we're causing meiosis, so that's going to be those circular muscles being constricted by acetylcholine to cause meiosis. So think about after you eat a big dinner, um, you're just kind of resting, chilling out. Like you don't need a ton of, you don't need to see a whole lot of stuff, right? So you can constrict those muscles down. So there'd be acetylcholine, norepinephrine. That's coming from which nervous system? Sympathetic. So imagine bear pops out. I need to see a whole lot of stuff so I can run away from it and not trip over something. So it's going to cause mydriasis to occur, and so that's going to lead to those radial radial muscles pulling that apart, right? When those constrict, it's pulling that apart rather than the circular muscles constricting down on the pupil. That make sense? 
this is important because like when I'm evaluating patients, like especially for drug overdoses, um, someone who's got a whole lot of cocaine in their system, releasing a ton of norepinephrine, I expect to see big old saucer plate kind of pupils, right? Because they should be having those radial muscles really pulling pulling those uh, pulling the pupil apart there. Uh, versus someone who had, say, uh, too much acetylcholine due to uh, an organophosphate, they would have myotic pupils. That's what I would expect to see at least. And that doesn't, you know, drive, that doesn't really, is not consistent. Then you say, well, the patient might not have been exposed to this, maybe it was something else. And then you have to kind of work up a differential. But does that make sense? All right. Moving on, Mother Russia has, come on, we need USA to come back. <laughs> Make PA school great again. Um, just kidding. Just kidding. Uh, which of the organ systems is responsible for protection and thermoregulation? Should be a pretty easy one. Yep, that'd be the integumentary system. Bones probably not so good at thermoregulation. They're kind of just uh, not really doing a whole lot. Um, endocrine certainly could affect thermoregulation if you think about the, uh, you know, especially like the thyroid gland and whatnot. Uh, but it doesn't do a whole lot of protection for us necessarily. Uh, but yeah, integumentary, absolutely. How can we control temperature through the integumentary system? Sweating is a big one. Uh, shivering. Yeah, so those are all good things we can do. That's more of the musculoskeletal system, to be honest, but the sweating is going to be one of the big things that we can do. The kind of evaporative type cooling. Um, but you can also have like vasodilation that allows for better blood flow, so you can off, uh, bring up that heat. You know, so all that's really useful. Okay. Moving on. Which of the following molecules is the starting point for the Krebs cycle? Acetyl-CoA, pyruvic acid, citric acid, glucose. What do we think? Answer acetyl CoA. Yep. Someone has some qualms with this question? Eventually, but it goes into uh, the, the pyruvic acid gets converted to acetyl CoA, and that's when it enters into the, the Krebs cycle, right? Like, it actually says on your PowerPoint that the Krebs I'll have to go back and review that, but. At least you guys knew it was not pyruvic acid, right? Okay. So this is a lot more granular than I'd probably get necessarily than the test. Like, I'm probably not getting specific into, like, you know, what reaction, you know, what, uh, kind of two molecules come together to form acetyl-CoA, anything like that. I'd probably be more specific in, like, what are the byproducts of this? Like, you know, where is oxygen being used? Uh, what are the byproducts of that process? You know, what, what goes into the system uh, to generate that? So those are the kind of questions I'm going to ask here. Um, but that's a good, good feedback, and I can update uh, this quiz for the next time. Thanks for being forgiving of my fallibility. Okay. Hopefully this does not affect the winner uh, at all. Oh, oh no, we see Mother Russia has been overtaken though. So maybe I, I rigged the uh, the questions. Uh, so, no, I'm just kidding. I didn't do that. Okay. Okay. In DNA, which of the following nucleotides would form complementary hydrogen bonds? I think it has to get converted over. I thought that was the first. Step. I'll, I'll, we'll look at that slide uh, before we're finished up. Uh, when the pyruvic acid gets converted to acetyl coate, we, we have to take a look at it. Yeah. Okay. So, again, what's the, the big delineation here in the answers? Yeah, so again, there's two right answers here. So, again, adenine and thymine should go together in DNA. What would be the difference here if it was RNA? Yeah, it'd be uracil and adenine, right? So again, cytosine, guanine go together. C, G, A, and T, 
or you and A go together, right? And, and RNA specifically. We'll look at the slide. Yeah, I was thinking before the desktop here, so. Okay. All right, next question. Uh, which enzyme catalyzes cyclic GMP and causes sodium channels to close when light affects rhodopsin? I'll give you a really good clinical example why this is important. Uh, answer the question. You may be like, who cares about that? Probably guess this one just on process of elimination, I would think. Okay, so rhodopsin, where do we find rhodopsin at? In the eyes, we're at in the eyes. Yeah, the rods. The cones are going to have uh, their own kind of. It's a little different, but yeah, essentially uh, the rods are going to have the rhodops in there. It's that visual purple. That's why we can see green light uh, really well in like nighttime. That's why you like night vision goggles and stuff has green light, so we can see it a little bit better. Um, but yeah, so phosphodiesterase is an important enzyme that actually breaks down cyclic GMP, so that way those channels close, right? And so when the channels close, those cells end up actually hyperpolarizing. So it's kind of the opposite of what you see with a lot of like action potential generation, and that is what's going to send the signal down to uh, you know the ganglial cells and all that sort of stuff that eventually go to the optic nerve. Say, hey, light is affecting uh, this rhodopsin. Okay, which um, in um, uh, vitamin is really important for vision. Or if you have uh, vitamin A, otherwise you end up uh, not being able to make a lot of that rhodopsin unless you get night blindness. Right. Um, adenyl cyclase does what for us? converts ATP to cyclic AMP, right? So adenyl cyclase makes sense, you know, uh, put those two together, AMP, uh, cyclic AMP gets formed from ATP and this is the adenyl cyclase, where we get their second messenger from. Um, what does lactate dehydrogenase do for us? Yeah, so it can interconvert pyruvic acid to lactic acid or lactic acid to pyruvic acid. It can do either, uh, depending on uh, kind of what uh, tissue you're going to be in. So we we're kind of talking about that before class, like the Cori cycle, right? That's how we can help to recycle some of that lactic acid uh, in, within the liver. Hopefully, I didn't give away a question that comes up later. Um, what does uh, RNA polymerase do for us? Creates RNA. That's yeah, pretty easy. Um, all right, so phosphodiesterase, the reason why this is important is we mentioned uh, the drug uh, sildenafil, otherwise known as Viagra. Uh, that actually works as a phosphodiesterase inhibitor, causes vasodilation uh, to allow for better blood flow to the penis, and then you yeah, can have an erection. Uh, but also one of the rare side effects you can actually end up seeing uh, with patients taking sildenafil is temporary blindness you can actually have uh, because it can actually affect uh, some of the um, so Denfil specifically can affect that phosphodiesterase as well there's enough cross reactivity there so if you ever hear about someone going blind after taking Viagra that's why it's due to that enzyme being affected see there's a method to the madness you're like why why would erectile dysfunction pills make you go blind well that's why okay I didn't say it was like too terribly interesting but at least you know clinical correlation there okay Yes, adenyl cyclase will turn ATP over into cyclic AMP, right? So when you have like a, those G proteins, that's one of the secondary messenger pathways where a G protein can uh, activate adenyl cyclase. And then once you have cyclic AMP, that can affect your know, protein kinases and do whatever else it needs to do. Okay. Which cycle allows for recycling of lactic acid in the liver that I just gave away? An alternative name would be the Feldman cycle. <laughs> Bad joke. Be the Cori cycle, right? Um, citric acid is also synonymous with what cycle? The Krebs cycle. Citric acid cycle, Krebs cycle is the same there. Uh, what does glycolysis do? Breaks on glucose into two, two pyruvic acids. And then our, what is our Krebs cycle really doing for us, though? 
yeah, it produces protons essentially, right? Some of them being carried by NAD, some by FAD. Um, so they can be carried over to the, uh, the or they're already in the mitochondria, it can go down and undergo pho oxidative phosphorylation, right? So the Cori cycle, though, that's where the liver is taking lactic acid, producing other tissues like the muscle, converting back over to pyruvic acid, where it can eventually be converted back into glucose, right? That is an, is an energy intensive process, so it's not 100% efficient, but it allows us to kind of utilize that lactic acid that would otherwise be wasted. Okay. Moving on. Uh, phosphorus has five, 15 protons, 16 neutrons, and 15 electrons. What is its atomic mass? Thirty-one. Why is that? Protons versus uh, plus neutrons. Absolutely right. So the electrons are near weightless, uh, so we do not include those. If I said, what was the atomic number of phosphorus? What would you say? Fifteen, right? Because that's only based on the on the protons we have there, right? Because we have different amounts of neutrons, and that makes you know, different isotopes and whatnot. Um, did you about the the one atom was talking to another atom and said, hey, I think I, I lost an electron. And he goes, are you sure? And he goes, yeah, I'm positive. <laughs> Okay, uh, which of the following molecules would be considered polar? Ooh, that was pretty quick. Do you know what type of, of bears dissolve in water? Polar, polar bears. bears, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Only once. Are you coming up with these on the spot, or do you have a bank? Um, <laughs> little column A, little column B. <laughs> It's like an associative kind of memory thing. Like if you asked me at any other time, uh, chemistry joke, I probably wouldn't know a whole lot off the top of my head, but uh, you know, if I start thinking about it. Um, i trying to say that the massive proportion of my brain power goes to getting jokes ready just in case I can uh, <laughs> use them. Okay, so just remember, you know, water is polar because it kind of has those kind of uneven uh, sharing between the electrons. I made a picture here so you can kind of compare the four molecules. Again, things like CO2 would end up being uh, having kind of equal uh, positive versus negative distribution here. Here's like methane, would be CH4, O2 itself is nonpolar, but really only um, uh, dihydrogen monoxide here would be uh, would be polar just because the, the hydrogens are being kind of forced over to one side to have an area of positivity versus the oxygen having an area of negativity there. Good. Okay, and I think three more. Uh, carbonic anhydrase is responsible for catalyzing which reaction? Hmm. Hmm. This is probably a little more in depth than I get to on the test, but I guess it depends on which subject you're talking about. So. Carbonic anhydrase is really important. We're talking about things like altitude sickness. You can take medications for that. Uh, it'll come up like in glaucoma, um, diuretics. Like, so th this is an important enzyme that will come up again and again. Actually, two right answers. So, right, so carbonic anhydrase is good because it can interconvert either between CO2 and water over to bicarbonate, or it can do bicarbonate into CO2 and water, right? Depending on where you need it to be stored at and which form, right? So, especially um, when the, like the red blood cells are picking up carbon dioxide from the tissue, you don't necessarily want to keep it in that carbon dioxide form. You can convert it over into bicarbonate and you can use it for acid-base balance, like as a buffer system, right? Um, versus, uh, you know, something like this, this is just kind of a passive process that occurs as a, uh, depending on the pH and whatnot, these, these can dissociate on their own. Don't really need an enzyme for this process. Okay. Yes. That would be when we're talking about the buffer system, uh, I think in lecture one or two. 
because we were talking about how like you know uh, the red blood cells will pick up carbon dioxide from the tissues and be able to drop it off in the lungs right that process that occurs allows us to buffer so when you have too much co2 you end up causing more bicarbonate to be produced um, so you can notice how that reaction can kind of go either way so this is really important for the buffering system uh, especially right because when I have too many hydrogen ions around, say I get too acidotic, they can combine with this HCO3, right? And that will end up forming this H2CO3, which I can then convert into carbon dioxide. So like this reaction here, and then I can breathe that off. So that's how I get rid of excess acids is by producing that carbon dioxide. Yes, sir. Uh, can you just chill for a second? Sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. I've not had that happen before, actually. Yeah, that disconnected. That's weird. It would be. I guess there are different. Um, I figure you guys would be all hitting that. I guess there's two of them there. Four. There's just three, maybe. I think I disconnected uh, from the Wi-Fi. Huh? Yeah, exactly. Hmm. The 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 actual prize is not that great, so I don't want to worry about that too much. Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. just stretching. Um, yeah, so things like uh, we'll talk about like glaucoma meds that are really important because if it um, uh, they can actually inhibit carbonic anhydrase, that's usually where we're going to see that at. Uh, and it's important for uh, flow of the aqueous humor, right? We talked about that, that builds up too much. You can see uh, glaucoma develop, so we can utilize drugs to help get rid of some of that uh, aqueous humor, de decrease production essentially. Uh, do you know what you do with a dead chemist? Can't heal him. Can't cure him. <laughs> Got to bury him. <laughs> trying to think of any other good ones. Huh? You heard that one. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to stall for time here, guys. I'm stalling. Jeez. I guess, yeah, it goes with the Russia theme. I'm stalling. Um, you guys are good? Awesome. Okay, let's continue on. I was running out of jokes. <laughs> All right, insulin increasing expression of glucose transporters on the cell surface is an example of. So this would be facilitated diffusion. Again, simple diffusion is what? Just passing through the membrane kind of on its own, right? No, no energy is being expended there. No actual transporters are needed for that to occur. Uh, active transport, though, is when we're actually using energy for that to happen, so ATP most, uh, most often. Um, with the facilitated diffusion, that's where we're having some other factor coming in helping to get that process started. So with insulin, it actually helps to increase the expression of glucose transporters in the cell surface to allow for glucose to come in, right? So again, we need that extra transporter there uh, for that process to occur. Huh? It's still passive. It's still a passive process because you're not requiring energy. But again, if that glucose transporter is not there on the cell surface, it's not gonna, it's not never gonna happen, right? Glucose is never gonna cross that membrane or that barrier by itself. Okay. And the last question: Which of the following hormones increases sodium in water uh, and then increases potassium excretion? So it increases sodium in water reabsorption and and leads to potassium excretion. You guys want to hear a joke about potassium? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So aldosterone, this is uh, our mineralic corticoid, right? So when this gets stimulated, this helps to retain water, helps retain salt, but will excrete potassium. So you can see uh, hypokalemia develop as a result of too much aldosterone being sent out. Um, obviously, which, one, which two of these are kind of um, uh, antagonistic to one another? Yep, somatostatin and growth hormone. And then what does thymopoietin do? Yeah, white blood, white blood cell production, absolutely. 
Fantastic. I think that's it. That's the last one. Okay, so we had Don Juan taking the lead. Who's and if you're able to uh, announce your your identity? Two Don Juans. It's kind of cheating if they were working together. Interesting. It was him. Nice. Uh, John S. Fantastic. Oh, Josh S. Sorry, I misread that. I, I'm bad at reading. Uh, and then Tizzy. Awesome. Fantastic. So you guys get one free answer on the test. You ready? B. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, just kidding. Gotta make it fair for everyone. Um, any questions uh, that I can answer based off of this? You look at that citric acid cycle. Um, let's. Do you remember if that was in the third lecture? Okay. Should be in the third one. You said. This is still recording this, so you guys will be able to see this afterwards. Um, see how wrong I was. 20. 20. Yep, so it, so, it sees, so this is what's specifically entering the Krebs cycle that gets converted to Krebs. Exact verbiage. Yeah, exact verbiage, you're right. So, so to show you, uh, it, this did come up on a test. Like, if, it, if you guys could give me, uh, if you guys could act actively refute me like, as you just did, um, then we would we do give back, basically. I would, I would just give credit for both of those answers, right? Uh, so that's, that's, we would try to err on the side of being fair to you guys. So if you can prove us wrong, good on you. Okay, so any other questions I can answer? Yes, ma'am. No. Yes, ma'am. Shh. For that, one, for that question? I guess with that one, you would have just... Be, I would, I, based on the wording, I guess you could say it would be citric acid, but to me, like, I think acetyl-CoA gets sent into the cycle and then it gets, it kicks everything off when it gets converted over to citric acid. So that, that initial enzyme step is what's kind of setting the whole thing in motion, essentially, right? So we're probably splitting hairs, but again, as long as you guys kind of know the, the basics of it, like, you guys aren't going to be biochemists, right? Um, no one, none of your patients are going to be like, so, um, excuse me, uh, Mr. and Mrs. PA, uh, which uh, product is going to start off the Krebs cycle? <laughs> they don't care, right? But it's important to understand energy metabolism within the cell, and, and when you have patients who are going into aerobic or anaerobic metabolism and those kind of things, you go first. So that's the question that involves the Mm-hmm. Um, the insulin receptor itself is a is a tyrosine kinase receptor, right? So that does get phosphorylated, but the actual transport of glucose um, is not an energy dependent process, right? So insulin is kind of a facilitator for that, but getting those glucose transporters onto the cell membrane uh, and allowing for glucose to actually come in that's the that's the facilitated diffusion there. The fact that the transporters are even there in the first place, right? Because It's kicking off the cascade. <laughs> right, so insulin is kind of kicking off the whole process, which the the actual um, the receptor itself ends up getting phosphorylated because it's a tyrosine kinase receptor, right? Um, but the actual transport of glucose itself, after those uh, transports get up to the cell membrane, allows for diffusion of that to occur finally. So that, that's the facilitated diffusion step. Right, because otherwise those transporters are going to stay within the cytoplasm on a vesicle somewhere, and they're never going to get expressed out on the surface. So the actual transport of glucose is considered a facilitated diffusion, right? The the presence of glucose, right? So those channels allow for the glucose to transport in finally. So it's not like the insulin itself is or any kind of energy is causing the channels to open. As long as they're expressed out there, they allow for glucose to come in. They trigger the cell to to take those because uh, again the, the in in the cytoplasm there's vesicles that have those transporters just kind of hanging out right and so when insulin triggers that they're going to uh, express them out on the cell surface yeah yep any other questions I can answer yes ma'am is it can I ask any question any question you want okay. I can't guarantee I'll be able to answer but Blame diversity it doesn't really have any physiologic effect, at least that I'm aware of. Okay. Uh, but some small amount of uh, thyroid hormone gets, uh, some small amount of when those two um, iodotyrosines get together, whether it be the diiodo or monoiodo, some small portion of it's going to be the reverse T3, but it doesn't really do anything for us. So you said some, so something is stored, so when you have a, a low iodine, 
So you're gonna have excess like kind of thyroid hormone and, and iodine that gets stored up over time. So like, um, so for instance, like if I cut out all iodine on my diet right now, I still have enough stored up to where I can. I, you wouldn't manifest that for at least you know weeks to months. And that has nothing to do with reverse T3. Nothing to do with reverse T3. Nope. It's just a byproduct. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, essentially, yeah. Yeah, because uh, kind of one of the rules I always tell people like when we're talking about diuretics and stuff is that wherever salt goes, water wants to follow it, right? Just based on like the tenacity talk we we're talking about. Um, so when the kidneys are trying to hold on to more sodium and at the expense of potassium, uh, water likes to go with it too. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, did you guys like the, the review format? You guys are okay watching an extra video? Okay, hopefully that was helpful. Um, hopefully it's indicative of uh, the test. Uh, you guys may or may disagree with me. I think it's indicative, but um, at least there's only be one right answer for all those questions, so key point there. All right, uh, if not, uh, I'll answer any questions you guys have via email or be in my office whenever. Feel free to stop by, uh, and we'll go from there. Good luck studying.